Welcome everybody. We are going to start our walking video very soon. Uh, as a reminder, I just wanted to let everybody know that we are going to head down to the second floor. I ask that as we are walking around the second floor that we do not talk to other students in the hallway, that we are not waving in the classrooms or stopping at other people's doors, that you're just walking. When you get to the lobby area of the uh, of the school, please you know keep walking. Also, uh, there is no reason to stop and have a conversation. This is an experiment, and if it goes well, we can uh, try it again. I am going to be very interested in what your input is after we complete this exercise. So, uh, let's get started. Well, I want to begin with. This lesson is going to be about America's founding documents. Most specifically, we are going to look at the Declaration of Independence, which was officially signed on July 4th, 1776. This, as you remember, is our, our Independence Day as American citizens. So, uh, to give you a little bit of background on this, remember that starting in 1775, about a year or, or more before this, in April, was the firing on Lexington and Concord. And the this is kind of the beginning, we consider, of the American Revolution. The problem was that what was happening had not been defined. And there was bloodshed and there were dead bodies in Massachusetts, but it was just limited to what was happening in Massachusetts. And it's going to be the job of the Continental Congress to take these events and then craft them in a way that convince other people that this is the time that we should declare independence. Well, flash forward to January 1776, Thomas Paine writes a pamphlet known as Common Sense. And in this, he makes the argument, which then was considered a very radical argument for American independence. And Paine will argue that it was contrary to common sense for a large continent, such as the United States, or what would become the United States, to be ruled by a small distant island, meaning Great Britain. And this pamphlet was read in a huge manner. Uh, over the next six months, this pamphlet would reach hundreds of thousands of Americans. So keep that in mind that you're having a battle going on. You have this well-read uh, pamphlet being circulated in the colonies. Well, the delegates who then arrive at the Second Continental Congress are very interested in what's going on and what kind of statement that they would make to the American people. Well, Richard Henry Lee, who was the presiding officer of the Continental Congress, will form a delegation of five people. Benjamin Franklin, Robert Livingston, Roger Sherman, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. Well, these men, um, they didn't really, I mean, they knew each other, but they, they weren't friends, you would say. And they were tasked with this great feat to write this statement of independence. Well, after having conversations, the Committee of Five was reduced to a Committee of Three, Franklin, Adams, and Jefferson. Well, Franklin and Adams had made some enemies of people while at the Continental Congress. Um, John Adams um, self-admitted that he was obnoxious and he was afraid that if he wrote the document then automatically people would vote no. So Franklin and Adams agreed that the person who was best suited to write this document was Thomas Jefferson. He hadn't offended anybody in the time that he had been in Congress. He had barely spoken to anyone while he was there. Uh, Jefferson actually spent much of his time looking out the window and um, thinking about his wife. He was newly married and he missed her dearly. So Jefferson would then sit down and write the document. Um, and it took him about a long weekend to get much of it down on paper. 
Well, to give you a little idea about Jefferson, he was in his early 30s at the time of this document, and he based much of uh, the document or the Declaration of Independence on the ideas of John Locke. And one of the ideas central to the Declaration of Independence would be all men are created equal. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, how can all men be created equal and the fact that many of these men, Jefferson included, owned slaves. The idea behind the document was something to aspire to. It was an aspirational document. The hope that all we are all human beings and that over time we can overcome this notion of slavery and that we would be a truly united people. Now Jefferson, in his lifetime, maintained slaves up until the day he died. However, uh, he was somebody who, uh, had he freed them, they would have had nowhere to go. So Jefferson maintained that he would he kept his slaves, but he also wanted to treat them very well. And you can argue and debate on how valid an argument that is and was an excuse just to maintain slaves. The fact is, he had them. However, his ideas of eventually getting rid of slavery or abolishing it did happen in the United States. And we look at the Declaration of Independence as something to live up to. And we fail constantly as a nation, and we do not always live up to these ideals, but they are still something that we can strive for. Well, when you look at the document and you break it down, you can really break it down into five parts. The introduction, which introduces what they're going to do. The preamble, which will use many of the words of John Locke, the idea of natural rights and social contract and how the British government has broken that social contract. And this is why the, uh, the United Colonies are justified in rebelling. The most important part of the document at the time was the middle part. And this is probably the part that you probably don't know much about. These, this is the area where much of the document starts out with, he has done this and he has done that. These are all grievances levied against King George III. Up until this point, the King of England was beloved by most Americans. And it was strongly debated on should we continue to blame Parliament or should we focus our attention on the king? Well, as some of you may know from literature, TVs, and movies, it always makes for a good story to have one central villain, and King George III would become that central villain. And we laid blame for the entire revolution on King George III in the Declaration of Independence. Well, the last two parts of the Declaration of Independence were justifying why we are fighting uh, to free ourselves from England, and then a final statement of separation with a list of all the names of the delegates who would sign. You may have heard the story that the person who signed his name for the largest was John Hancock. Well, when the Declaration was first presented to Congress on July 2nd, there was a lot of debate. By July 4th, John Hancock would sign his name to the document. And I believe he was the first person to sign his name. And as he said famously, the British ministry can read that name without spectacles, let them double the reward. And John Hancock would then sign his name quite large so you could read his name without putting on your glasses. And he made sure the king knew that he was for independence. Adams, Jefferson, Franklin would also sign their name, their names to the document. 56 people, 56 men would sign their names in total. It all didn't happen in one large signing ceremony on July 4th. Actually, many of the people signed their names that July, August, and even into September. 
before the document then was uh, typeset and published and then sent out to all 13 colonies where it was read in the town square of many towns and villages in 13 American colonies. But I want to point out to you that all men who signed their name to this document were committing treason and they were going to face some pretty harsh penalties if they were ever captured. They could have been jailed, lose, lost their property, but probably they would be sentenced to death. Well, let's look at a part of the document. This is in the beginning. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, the first thing I want to point out to you is the document starts out with we. We hold these truths, that we Americans agree that there are certain truths that are self-evident, that are obvious to everyone. And one of those main truths is the idea of all men, all people, are created equal. And we are created equal because of our Creator. And these rights are unalienable, meaning these rights are natural rights, and they cannot be taken away by any government. And the rights that Jefferson focuses on, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That we have the right to our own livelihoods, we have the right to be free people, and we have the right to be happy. Well, this document, as, I, as we said, 56 men did sign this document. But it wasn't without concern. As I've said to you, people signing this document were signing potentially their own death warrant. Well, because after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, remember the United States, or what would become the United States, was at war with Britain. And one of the um, battles that, that the British would have was the battle to take Philadelphia, which the Continental Congress, that's where they were meeting. So the Continental Congress was in and out of Philadelphia over the next several years, and they had to hide out in various places, one of them being Baltimore, Maryland, another one, York, Pennsylvania. Well, as they are hiding out, um, John Hancock supposedly said that we must all now hang together, that we are together, that we must unite. While Franklin, who was being kind of snarky and trying to be funny, said, yes, we must all indeed hang together, or most assuredly, we shall hang separately, meaning if they are caught, they would be put to death. They are, again, they are wanted men. They had no idea how this would all turn out. Thank goodness for all of us here that it turned out well enough that as America, we became a brand new country. The war would be a long one. It would, would not be over until 1783. And the reason we won mainly had to do with the fact that we were financed by the British or by the French uh, against the British. And had the French not helped us, the war could have gone on much longer, or we may not have won at all. Well, thank you very much for doing this walking and learning activity. I would ask all of you to return to the library. Uh, you can turn your, your iPads off. Remember, as you go back, to not talk to other people in the hallway and to do so quietly and not look and wave in other classrooms. Uh, if we borrowed anything from the library, this is the time that we will return them, and then we'll head back up to the classroom. Uh, I will explain the Flipgrid activity that you will now that you will make up in the classroom, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And let me know what your thoughts are. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you back up in the classroom.